Now, what we'd like to figure out is how to get a bright spot, constructive interference. We want constructive interference between these two rays when they hit over here. So we have to figure out how big does the path length difference have to be to get constructive interference between these two things. Um, well, first of all, we have to have a path length difference that's going to get these back into phase with each other. Um, right now, if you, just take into, if you just think about the inversion, they're out of phase. If we just take into account the effect of the inversion, they're out of phase. So how big of a path length difference do we want to get them back into phase? Well, half a wavelength. If they're already half a cycle out of phase, and then one goes half a cycle longer than the other, that would bring them back into phase. OK, so in this case, we need a path length difference of half a wavelength. Or one and a half wavelengths. If there was a path length difference of one and a half wavelengths, at, there would still be a half wavelength difference, half a cycle difference, and that would cancel out the inversion over here. Or two and a half wavelengths. So how would the mathematicians say this? Well, the mathematicians would say that we need a path length difference of m plus one half, where m is any integer. This is our index. As I said in the other video, you have to ask whether m could be 0. Well, m could totally be 0 here. That's just the original case where there's just a half wavelength difference between these. So this is our basic formula. All we need to do is remember, how do we figure out the path length difference? What is the path length difference in terms of the variables we've been talking about here? How much further does the second ray go than the first one? It goes uh, 2D. Yeah, this is a impor very important idea. Like I said, we can't just memorize our, our formula here because the formula depends on what the mediums are. So it's going to be our job to always come up with the formula first. So here's going to be the formula um, for this particular case when we go from air to a film to the air. Here's the formula. Um, we know the path length difference is 2D. And then we said to ourselves, because of this inversion, we need a path length difference that will cancel the inversion. That means there needs to be this extra half wavelength to cancel the, uh, the inversion. There was only one inversion, so we need to cancel that. OK, so that gives us uh, this formula over here. All right, now notice that if you change m, you're going to change lambda. D is kind of, um, in, in some cases, d is kind of fixed. That's just the thickness of the film. Sometimes we'll, we'll vary that. But if you adjust your m, you'll adjust your lambda. So that means that there will be a bunch of different wavelengths that will give bright spots. And of course, there will be many wavelengths that give dark spots. And that means they're kind of canceled out. So we're going to see some colors from this film. We know that in real life, we tend to see colors reflected off, um, colors reflected off of films. Um, and this is the reason, even if it was hit with white light, a lot of the white light will not satisfy this constructive interference, and it'll be destroyed. Only some of the colors will come through here. All right, now um, let's see here. Notice that there's a minimum M. What's the smallest that M could ever be? Zero. Yeah, that was this case over here. So actually, most of these problems focus on uh, the wavelength you get with the minimum m. Now, if m is as small as possible, this is another case where we have to do that thinking on paper that we talked about last time. When m is very small, does that mean that lambda has to be very big or very small? Will the minimum m give us the minimum lambda or the maximum lambda? When m is very small here, is lambda going to be big or small? It's going to be the minimum lambda. lambda. Looks like we need some more practice with that thinking on paper. So, so what we're thinking about here is changing m and seeing how that affects lambda. Now we're going to keep d constant. Okay. We just want to know the effect of changing m on lambda. So suppose that we decrease m. Well, that would tend to make this not a true equation, because that would tend to make the, the right-hand side smaller than the left-hand side. What do we have to do to lambda to make sure that the equation will still be true, and that these, this times this will still equal this constant? If we're decreasing this term, does this term have to increase or decrease so this will still be a constant? It has to increase. All right, I think that's the, maybe the opposite of your first guess. So again, this is an example of what I mean by thinking on paper. Um, we want to know the relationship between these two things, which means if we hold everything else constant, 
If we change one of the variables, how does the other one have to change so that the equation is still right? Well, if this number is getting very small, this number has to be very big, or they can't still multiply to give this constant over here. But that means that there's a maximum lambda. Since there's a minimum m, there's a maximum lambda. And most of the problems are kind of asking you for this maximum wavelength. The maximum wavelength, where do we get a bright spot? Uh, so how would you figure out the maximum wavelength? Well, what would you plug in for m to find the maximum wavelength? Zero. Yeah. You would plug in, and then you would solve this algebraically. That's what most of the problems are like. Okay. So to solve these problems, first of all, you have to get the right equation by taking into account the inversions. And then uh, you might have to decide what m you're plugging in. By the way, of course, this would mean zeroth order, first order, second order, and third order. But many, very often, they don't say zeroth order. They just ask, what's the maximum wavelength? Well, that really tells us the minimum m, which is zero. OK. I forgot something. All right. I forgot a pesky uh, complication here. All right, so what's the thing that I uh, forgot? Actually, I don't know if we even talked about this last time. So, all right, so remember that in a vacuum, um, the light goes at the speed of light c. Now, one thing we didn't talk about, we should have emphasized, is that all different wavelengths and frequencies go at the same speed in a vacuum. In a vacuum, all wavelengths and frequencies travel at the same speed, which is never capital C. I'm sorry, lowercase c is the speed of light in a vacuum. Now, do you remember when they moved into a material? Does the material speed them up or slow them down? It slows them down. Right, but I think what we didn't talk about last time is that different wavelengths and frequencies get slowed down by different amounts. Different wavelengths get slowed down by different amounts. And the material Uh, sorry, n tells you how much you're being slowed down. The index of refraction tells you how much you've been slowed down. What that means is that different wavelengths have different ends. By the way, what's the difference between waves with different wavelengths? How would you look at a wave and see the two waves have different wavelengths from each other? Uh, the color? Yeah, wavelength and frequency is colors. That means different colors get slowed down by different amounts. Okay. Um, so if we look at our formula here, another important formula. This is always true that speed equals frequency times wavelength. This is a crucial formula that's likely you might have to use. Speed equals frequency times wavelength. Um, well, uh, let's see what's going to happen here then. Remember that when we move into a different material, what happens to the speed? When you move out of a vacuum and into a material, does the speed go up or down? So let's think on paper again. If the frequency is constant, what's going to happen to the wavelength? If the speed is going down, what happens has to happen to the wavelength? It's going to go up. Like this? Or, uh, excuse me, if the, if, if the speed is going down and the frequency is constant, then the wavelength is going to go down. Yeah, and if we went with your first guess, it wouldn't be a true equation anymore. The left-hand side can't go down and the right-hand side go up and it'd still be a correct equation. So what we saw now is, last time we saw that when you move into a different material, you slow down. Now we're also seeing, when you move into a different material, your wavelength decreases. When you move into a different material, your wavelength decreases. So we need to have a, a way of figuring out uh, that wavelength. Uh, what's that new wavelength uh, going to be? When we're in a vacuum, we know the speed is the frequency times the wavelength. Then when we're in a material, we have to use a different symbol for speed. We know the frequency is the same, we're just going to memorize that. When you move from one material to another, it's not the frequency that changes, it's the wavelength. So I need a different symbol for the wavelength. So the symbol that we use is lambda with the subscript n. This means the new wavelength in the new material that has an index of refraction of n. This is the new wavelength in the new material with an index of refraction of n. 
All right, in the vacuum, our speed is c, and our wavelength is lambda. In the new material, the frequency is the same, but we have a lower speed and a lower wavelength. All right, uh, and then if you divide these two equations into each other, you can just divide these two equations, c divided by b on the left, and divide the right-hand side as well. The frequencies cancel. 